ABC News Presentation. Good evening and welcome to Interface. My name is Ashraf Garda. I'm standing in for Tembisa Machele. The Department of Communications is currently reviewing the ICT policy to ensure that it is relevant and responds to the rapid developments in technology. Communications Minister Yunus Karim has kick-started public hearings on the green paper on integrated ICT policy. The aim is to make ICTs accessible, cheaper and safer and to bring legislation up to speed with global trends. Minister Karim is our guest this evening and he is in our Pretoria studio. As usual, we welcome your comments on our Facebook page, Interface on SABC3. Well, good evening, Minister, and welcome uh, to Interface. Very important issue in terms of ICT as a priority for government. Tell me about that. Yes, well, good evening to you and the, le and the viewers as well. Obviously, uh, I'm sure you know, uh, developments in ICT occur very, very rapidly. Now, we reviewed... Uh, our policies over the last few months and now have a green paper. We had uh, some 500 or so people in the uh, national public hearings yesterday and from this Friday onwards we get provincial public hearings for the next six weeks. Now in uh, the period from 1995 to 1998 we uh, developed a separate white papers or policy documents on telecommunications, postal services and broadcasting and subsequently a green paper on e-commerce. We dealt with them separately, but obviously since that time, you have what we call in the ICT world convergence of technologies, where for example, a s the, s uh, the same device, for example, a cell phone, can be used to uh, uh, access internet, send SMSs, have voice calls, and indeed in parts of the world, watch TV too. So this convergence of technologies has meant a fundamental shift in the paradigm and the operations of technology, and it has huge consequences for the economy, for uh, development and job creation issues. Uh, so we're reviewing these policies with the aim of, in fact, uh, by the second half of this year having a white paper, which will provide the framework for updating and revamping our ICT legislation. Now, now you're fairly new in the position, I understand that, but would you say that it's a fair statement to make that for whatever reason South Africa is in fact lagged behind in that ICT race, mixed of course to that is the issue of broadband and therefore inaccessibility for the public? Yes, you're quite right. As government we've admitted to that, but now we're moving forward with speed. We're calling for the active participation of technical experts, civil society actors, NGOs, community organizations, business trade unions, and whoever. We all need to get together. We are utterly clear that in order for, uh, to meet our economic growth, development, and job creation targets, we have to uh, advance our ICT sector. Uh, we have to become a far more effective knowledge economy and information society. Our peer countries are moving ahead of us, and so we have to move fast. In broadband, we are beginning to move. On the 4th of December last year, Cabinet adopted what we call South Africa Connect, our broadband policy and strategy. And this very morning, uh, we're going to appoint the National Broadband Council. In fact, we've made some significant progress. Since the 4th of December, we have now connected with computers and an entire land system some 565 schools. We've achieved our target of 1,650 schools a month ahead. We also launched some two weeks ago the Ikamva eSkills Institute, which is directed at ensuring that people are able, once broadband is rolled out far wider than it currently is, to actually make use of broadband to understand its value to them that the cell phone is far more than just a device to make phone calls and send SMSs. It has considerable potential to be used in a variety of ways to connect people to the economy, to even provide for opportunities for self-employment as is happening in other parts of the developing world. Now, wh wh what's, uh, what's quite interesting here is, the in, in terms of the Green Paper, you're obviously calling for public comment. Wh what do you hope to achieve from it? Wh what are you expecting in terms of feedback and input? Well, in the first instance, we want this to be a cooperative effort. Uh, developing our ICT sector affects all of us because of its far-reaching 
consequences. We want new ideas on how we can go forward, and we certainly want to move uh, decisively. What we don't want is endless discussion. As you rightly say, we are lagging behind, and we can't continue to discuss forever. So our aim, firstly, is to make people particularly with the provincial public hearings where we're targeting communities, not just experts in the area or business or organized trade unions and other organized structures. We want people, we want the average person to be aware of how important technology is to their immediate material needs and their social inclusion. Uh, uh, we want them to understand, as I've just said, the value of the cell phone far beyond what it is understood to serve uh, in terms of its purpose. We want people to know that they can't rely wholly on government to deliver jobs. In particular, we are concerned about the high rate of youth unemployment. And wherever we've observed in the developing world where there have been in, uh, growth in, in youth employment, the ICT sector plays a very key role in that regard. It has huge potential to absorb the unemployed into some form of employment, uh, either self-employment mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. some sort of ICT sector. So, so, so what, what's interesting that gets us thinking that one in terms of the green paper, you may get tech geeks who give you input. The reality is the people who are in schools now, I'm talking about primary schools, high schools, are we at a level now where ICT understanding the tech industry has become a priority in terms of a vocation? Yes, absolutely. I mean, increasingly you're going to find, not least in our own country, given that the ANC has decided in our ele election manifesto, that over the next five-year period, 2014 to 2019, we're going to seek to ensure that every child has a tablet, a simple computer. Uh, you're going to find that as we evolve, and uh, rather sooner than you might imagine, we're going to find that uh, children at schools uh, and learners generally uh, are not going to take textbooks to school. They're going to have a tablet uh, in which there will be all the material they need for their studies. This is beginning to happen elsewhere in the developing world anyway, and we too must catch up with that and in fact exceed uh, what other countries have done, given our economic and political weight in this continent and in the developing world generally. So, so you don't have any more education simply by stuffing children in a classroom. I heard the other day, in fact, that Harvard University is also increasingly beginning to understand and making allowance for the number of uh, uh, learners they would have and students they would have who are online as compared to those who will physically be there in their bricks and mortar buildings. So increasingly, education is going to become an online function. One of the advantages, needless to say, of that is that it becomes more accessible and cheaper. But it does, of course, uh, mean that the universities as they currently exist have to uh, make fundamental changes in their strategies and their orientation. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes, so, so education and ICT are very interdependent. Indeed, so, so therefore in terms of that key word, costs, right? We'll talk later about the, the battle in terms of the uh, network operators, we're talking mobile comes up later, but just in terms of costs with regard to, to tablets, right? So that even the youngsters, children at school need to understand there's a new language being played out. Who's going to alleviate those costs? How do we make ensure that not only metropolitan areas but rural communities will have those tablets? Otherwise, there's a greater digital divide. Yes, yes, we're utterly aware that on the one hand, uh, uh, technology and ICT has huge, huge potential to reduce inequalities in our society, as indeed it's doing in many parts of the world. But it also has just as much poten potential to actually increase the divides between the haves and the have-nots, between the connected and the unconnected. And we simply cannot afford that in a country like ours, which has such huge inequalities anyway. Now, in respect of the tablets, obviously, it's a policy of the current majority party, the ANC. It will be put in the uh, medium-term strategic framework for 2014 to 2019. The national fiscus will have to provide for that, and we will have to roll it out. It will be presumably the Department of Basic Education, working in cooperation with the Department of Communication and uh, National Treasury and other relevant departments. Now, obviously, we'll not roll it out overnight, but we'll begin to do it over the period 2014 to 2019. Mind you, Gauteng has already begun to do that with schools in this province. So, <coughs> in a sense, excuse me, the process has started. Uh, we would like to do it, and most certainly, 
Uh, it's the rural areas that should be targeted because getting school books there is, uh, is more challenging. Uh, uh, people in the rural areas are generally poorer than those in the urban areas. And uh, what your question poses is the need for us to consider uh, targeting the rural areas first as we do this incremental rollout. I think that's a very useful subtext to what you're asking. Hmm. I, w I would think in the light of discussion around you know, bureauc bureaucratic delays from you know, communications on the one hand to education on the other, there probably would be, would be massive scope to allow entries in terms of entrepreneurs to get into that space with your support to ensure that that gap is, is, is bridged very, very quickly, not so. Well, we can consider some sort of public-private partnership system, and certainly we have to decide who would provide the tablets, and ideally it'll have to be a South African company, and given the scope of coverage, there'll be an incentive there for a South African company to take responsibility, or several South African companies as the tender might pan out. But the fact is that obviously uh, uh, we will have to work uh, uh, with appropriate uh, structures outside the government if that's necessary, not just the private sector, but NGOs and whatever. But it would seem to me to be reasonable to say that it's probably easier to roll out, if you like, a tablet than to roll out uh, school textbooks. Uh, we've been challenged in some respects. Okay, and, and therein lies the challenge. What's more to come, tell you what, if you have any doubt about the importance of, of the tax space in ICT, I would suggest you, you sort of throw that away because it's critically important. Lots more to come as we chat about the issue of costs. I think it's important uh, as we talk to the minister at line after this. Welcome back to Interface. I'm Ashraf Garda talking about ICT, green papers, policy documents, all of that centered around one thing, the issue of information technology and how it relates to you and how it can hopefully galvanize the nation in a way that, that we so desperately need. My guest is the Minister of uh, Communications, Minister Yunus Karim. Right, we were speaking earlier about uh, that important reach to, to the masses to be effective. What about cost factors? As we're talking right now, I mean, just a few days ago, in fact, uh, Telcom uh, putting a series of adverts in newspapers, uh, effectively attacking, asking questions of Vodacom as, as well as MTN in terms of their price structures. Just fill us in and where, where that is and what you can do about it. Well, firstly, it's ICASA, the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa, the regulator that decides uh, what we call interconnect uh, rates, meaning the cost, say, a Vodacom subscriber would pay if he or she is phoning somebody on MTN or Celsi or Telcom Mobile. So the uh, receiving uh, network operator would charge the uh, Vodacom in this case. Now, uh, that matter is decided by the regulator. The regulator decided on what you call a glide part to reduce the cost of interconnect fees that operators pay to each other, which effectively means it's the subscriber, the consumer, you and I, who pay. And they also decided to encourage competition because they decided that they would have a system of asymmetry. In other words, benefiting the smaller operators, Telcom, uh, Mobile, and Cell C, they would charge more to the bigger operators, Vodacom and MTN, to receive their calls than the other way around. Now, MTN and Vodacom uh, have about 85 to 90 percent of the revenue that is drawn from cell phone usage in this country. And uh, I think ICASA's view is that to reduce the cost for the consumer, you must reduce both the interconnect fees that operators pay to each other, but secondly, provide for a measure of asymmetry so that you encourage more competition and give more space for the smaller operators to be able to succeed. Now, there's a history to this. Both MTN and Vodacom benefited substantially as against Telcom for close to 15 to 20 years with asymmetry where they paid far less to telco uh, Telcom than Telcom did to them as a way of opening the door to mobile operators to be successful. So they've been huge beneficiaries of this very same asymmetry that they're now complaining about that would benefit Telcom, Mobile, and Cell C. Now, as a department and ministry, our job is to provide policy directives, but the actual regulations on such things are decided by the independent regulator. So we can't undermine the role of the regulator, but we can say that government and the ANC are very clear. The cost to communicate in this country is far too high. It is one of the reasons why global investors are reluctant to invest here, but domestic investors too. 
And we are saying that we need a balance between the needs of the mobile operators to secure an adequate rate of return on investment and to actually be having a surplus to reinvest, particularly in the underserviced and unserviced areas. We recognize that right. But we also have to take into account the needs of the poor and the disadvantaged and the economy as a whole. We've tried to plead with MTN and Vodacom to say that you're making substantial profits in this country. Telcom observes that in the 2012 year, MTN gave its shareholders 15 billion rands, Vodacom 12 billion rands. Now that's mm. substantial. In the case of Vodacom, owned by Vodafone substantially, South Africa, India, and one other country constitutes, we are told, the highest rate of return on the investment in the cell phone industry. So it's not as if by agreeing to this, they're going to be substantially damaged. And we're saying, look, it will benefit them too in the medium and long term because if the economy grows, there's development and job creation, their very customers will have more latitude to mm. use more of their services. But, 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 but I would sure. say with respect, if, if, I was a board as member, as if I was a director of, of MTN, of Vodacom, I, I'd be particularly concerned because the point you make, yes, but, but shrink, shrinked uh, profits, uh, shrinked margins in this case here, yeah, would certainly mean shrinked profits. Um, have, have they come back to you, uh, whether it's through you or even in CASA, to say, uh, CASA itself, to say, actually, yes, we, we're very willing to reduce costs, and, and by how much? You see, there's an extensive engagement that occurs between the regulator and the operators. We have no say on the matter as politicians. That's the law, and the Constitution provides for ICASA to play that role. So we did have informal engagements with them, and it's perfectly legally tenable to do so. Our sense is that one of the two operators is wholly unhappy with the dispensation. The other seems to suggest that they would actually agree to the interconnect fees. Their concern is asymmetry. And both seem to suggest that the process by which ICASA arrived at its regulations is debatable and questionable, and they're challenging it in court. Ultimately, should the matter be decided by a court, and should the court decide that ICASA has not conformed to the necessary processes, it's for ICASA to regularize that. It's not as if ICASA is likely to change the decision it's made. So it's a matter, I think, of uh, some delay, but it would seem to me, and I'm just making an observation, it's no prescription, obviously, that ICASA will very probably come back to where it is only a few months down the road. Now, if you're talking about a shrinkage of profits, I've already given you an answer for what it's worth, that in fact, it's not a significant enough shrinkage. And secondly, it benefits the economy as a whole. It's not some sort of generous gesture to the poor and disadvantaged, and it'll benefit them too. It's, I think, an over-preoccupation with short-term profits without looking at the medium-term and long-term benefits, not just to the economy as a whole, but to themselves as operators too. Okay, that's the issue r around uh, MTN and, uh, and, and Vodacom and how it affects you. Another institution that certainly impacts on you, I'm sure, is the SABC. We'll get the thoughts of the Minister right after this. Welcome back to Interface. My name is Ashraf Garda. Let's talk now about the SABC and, and where, where it is now and what needs to be done to, in many pe people's opinions, to sort of fix the problems with the SABC. The Minister of Communications, Yunus Karim, with me. Let's talk about the SABC. We know that uh, uh, Public Protector Tuli Marantella made some uh, recommendations just over a week or two back. Your thoughts on that? Well, it's not just thoughts, it's action. We were asked to do several things. In fact, five minutes after I got the report it was sent to the office of the chief state law advisor to tell us what is appropriate for a minister to do in terms of the law and uh, he came back to us within 72 hours we then referred that report to the SABC at a meeting last Thursday they have said to us that they have applied their mind to the report they have split into four committees to look at different aspects of the report they will come back to us very shortly to tell us the process by which they're going to act on the recommendations of the report, which exact recommendations they feel are legally tenable to act on, and the deadlines by which they would uh, fulfill that. And once they've done that, we will engage with them around the process. We must stress, actually, that there seems to be considerable misunderstanding. It is not for the minister to decide what to do in the first instance, both in terms of the law 
and corporate governance principles and norms. It is the South African Broadcasting Corporation Board that has to, in the first instance, apply its mind to the recommendations, decide on which, if any, they're going to act on uh, once they've got their legal advice, and then they come to us with their conclusions and we say to them as the ministry no we don't agree with you here or we agree with you here and then we engage with them around arriving at consensus on what to do about the report now what we are utterly clear about it doesn't matter what the public protector says there are some things that have to be addressed and the board agrees for example we need to set out in the memorandum of incorporation the precise role of the GCEO, the CEO, the mm -hmm. Chief Executive mm -hmm. Officer, as distinct from the Chief Operating Officer and the Chief Financial Officer. They work in a complementary way, but their distinct roles need to be set out. So on that, we agree. Secondly, we are ourselves preoccupied with the issue of why is it that the CEO of the SABC doesn't serve his or her full term. In fact, since 1994, I'm told, only two GCEOs have served the full term. Why is that the case? The public protector points to the need for the ministry to examine that. We've asked the department, I mean, sorry, the board to do exactly do these two things. Come with some recommendations on the respective roles of the three senior executive officers. Tell us what you think is or what you think are the reasons why the CEOs don't survive. Now, you see, in Parliament some two weeks ago, on the very day after the public protector released her report, we are to appear to explain what has come of the SIU investigation into the SABC. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. looked at uh, challenges in the SABC from 2006 to 2012. Indeed, the SIU report did lead to several cases of criminal uh, 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 being opened, criminal cases being opened at the Brixton Police Station. But the Parliamentary Committee rightly asked, that was done in 2012, how many of these cases have been acted on? So between the SIU, the SABC board and its representatives, the Department of Communications and a team of attorneys, we are now seeing exactly what was done, or pursuing what was done, mm -hmm. and we're going to report back to you Parliament. See, you, see, you see viewers watching you and I talking, and, and many people who follow the SABC on the various platforms, would be particularly concerned about uh, almost a, a serious damage to the reputation of the SABC on the one hand, uh, on the one, on the second hand, probably a lack of commitment to getting things done, considering the fact that it's been, it's, it's continued for over a decade, as you've just mentioned, right? You know, is, do you have a sense that the board has a commitment to fixing the problems? That means putting the SABC first as effectively the representative of the people? Well, the board has no choice, nor do we as a ministry. We are utterly clear as a ministry I imagine the government as a whole. The SABC is a very, very important institution to this country. I think generally all of us would agree it's working nowhere near as well as it should. The board itself acknowledges that it has to act decisively. To be fair to the board, since the public protector's report, it met 48 hours after the report was issued. It met on the subsequent Monday, that would be about five days later. And on a Thursday, four days later, or three days later, they met with us, and I'm told they're meeting this week. Mm -hmm. So they have been acting. But I okay. think what we must be utterly clear about, it's not only for the board. It's for government and the ministry, but it's for civil society to the extent it has a role. Okay. All of us have to contribute to make the SABC All right, work. And, and very quickly, Minister Kareem, what, what would you say to, to the critics who suggest the problem really is that it's being played as, as a political battleground, the SABC, and the way to resolve it is that it cannot be a board where it, which is rubber stamped by the president, therein lies the problem. Well, this very ICT green paper raises some of these issues. It is being discussed and was indeed yesterday. How should the board be appointed? Who should appoint it? How should we ensure accountability? What is the role of parliament, government and the president in respect of the SABC? Uh, what is the responsibility of the SABC to the public out there? It's a public broadcaster after all. All of these issues are very much on the agenda at the moment and we urge your viewers and yourselves, whoever you are, technical experts, please participate in this process. And, and that's where we're going to leave it, Minister Karim. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you indeed. So there you Thank are, you. Very, very important, isn't it, on two issues. Overall ICT issues need to be resolved and uh, the other issue around the SABC. Lots of questions, hopefully some answers in the future. Well, thank you so much for joining us and that's how we end the program this week. From me, Ashraf Garda and the team, goodbye.